we see abnormalities with nutrition. So nutritional deficits, we see food sensitivities, we see intestinal dysbiosis, which means abnormalities of the, the gut bugs, the flora that, that, live in, that live in the bowel. We see inflammation there. And we see problems with motility. We also know that autism affects the immune system. And so what are the research showing about that? It's, it's showing that there's uh, a lot of an increased rate of environmental allergies, um, chronic inflammation, autoimmune reactions, and frequent infections. And we also know that autism involves the, the metabolic or detoxification system. And, and there's a lot of studies now showing that there's problems with methylation, with oxidative stress, glutathione depletion, and heavy metal toxicity. And these are, we'll, we'll talk about each of these a little bit in more detail as we go forward. The problem with this is that, um, oops, I need to go backwards. I don't know how well I was projecting, but the problem with this, this issue is that there's all those little arrows. They're going back and forth. These systems are very tightly interactive with each other. And they're also systems that are not well understood. You know, so as far as brain or uh, medical systems, the immune system and the brain and you know, the metabolic system, are, those are the ones that we know the least about. Um, and so you know, it's, it can be very confusing as a researcher and a, and a doctor and as a parent trying to pick out which of these is your kid. And, you know, which, you know, because some kids have a lot of GI problems, others don't have any apparent GI problems. Some kids have a lot of obvious immune system issues and others don't. And so um, a lot of it is just trying to sort this out. And, and it can be very confusing because, um, you know, the other, the other problem with this is we don't really know yet where autism starts. Does it start in the brain? Does it start in the immune system? Does it start in the gut? Does it start with an environmental toxic, or, you know, environmental insult? We still don't know that for sure. And so, you know, knowing where to, to attack it from the beginning can be a challenge. And, and again, I think it may be different for different kids that all lead to a final common pathway. Okay, let's see. So, many of us feel overwhelmed at times. And I, and I know that as parents, we feel this way quite frequently. Believe me, as, as autism doctors, I feel this way a lot too, where, you know, trying to sort out um, the appropriate treatment for every child can, be, can definitely be a challenge and can be overwhelming. So for me, in order to, to make it less like an autism web and, and something that's a little bit more manageable, um, I, I kind of organize treatment in my head like this. And, and this is really the basic order of priority, but also the, um, the order of um, time spent or effort spent. Uh, as, as well um, in my practice. And now every kid is going to be a little bit different on this pyramid, but for the most part, I think most, most kids fit into this pathway. So it's, it's the base of this is nutritional, nutritional issues, you know, dealing with diet, dealing with basic nutritional support. Then we talk about the bowel and the GI tract and trying to address the issues there. Then we talk about detoxification, methylation, and oxidative stress support. Then the immune system and then you know, treating the brain. Now, the interesting thing about this pyramid is that what, what do most doctors that treat kids with autism emphasize all their time on? The whole pyramid yellow, right? So it's basically psychotropic medications. And, and you know, obviously behavior intervention is a big component of that, and I'm not gonna really address behavior treatment today so much other than just to say it's, it's absolutely important and it can't be separated from the biomedical treatment necessarily. How I look at it is that as we're treating them their, their medically, that's opening the door for the educational uh, and behavioral uh, interventions to be more effective. But you need to have both. So anyway, um, let's go through a little bit further. Okay, so I wanna take each of these things uh, individually and just kinda hit the highlights about, about why, why I treat it and why I think it's important. So starting with nutritional deficiencies. So this is what we were taught in medical school. You know, you get all the nutrients that you need from a normal varied diet. Uh, you know, in the U.S., I don't know if it's any different in Canada. I don't think so. But in the U.S., uh, I don't think we spent more than one or two lectures on nutrition in the entire four years of medical school. 
So doctors don't understand nutrition very well. That's the bottom line. And, you know, this, and it's just not considered to be all that important. I mean, we focus on pharmacology and, and how to treat disease through medications. Um, and I think a lot of it is that there's this assumption that, that you know, as long as you're eating a, a pretty normal diet, you're getting all the nutrients that you need. Um, the problem is, is that, that with that assumption that there's a lot of um, questions with that. And first is, is the typical Western diet healthy? Um, the second question is, are autistic children at particular risk nutritionally? Oops. Uh, I'm sorry. And third is, are nutritional supplements and special diets helpful or necessary? And so those are some of the things that I'd, I'd like to kind of address. So a normal nutrition, nutritional status assumes, number one, that you're eating a normal variety of foods and that you have normal digestion, that you can take that food and digest it and absorb it so that it's getting in, and fourth, that you can then utilize what the nutrients that are being absorbed appropriately um, in your body. And, you know, assuming that all those things are in place, then, yeah, what you're getting from your diet is appropriate. But in medication, there's a lot of illnesses that don't meet, don't meet those needs. And, and this is, these are illnesses that almost every mainstream medical doctor would acknowledge would benefit from some sort of nutritional support. So it's the elderly. It's mental incapacitated. Um, it's alcoholism. It's HIV or in other immunized compromised states. Diabetes, malabsorption syndrome, uh, syndromes, short bowel syndromes where they don't have enough bowel to absorb what they need, anorexia, pregnancy, cancer. So these are all changed metabolic states. I don't want to call them all diseases or disorders since pregnancy is probably not. But, um, but these, are, these are disorders that you require some other additional nutritional support. So the question is, does autism fit among that? Well, children with autism have very self-limited diets, most of them. You know, most of the kids that we see that come into our practice initially have a diet of about four or five foods. And it's chicken nuggets, it's cheesy crackers, um, you know, so it's not necessarily healthy food, but it's usually the, the four or five foods that they'll eat, um, and that's all they eat. And, and it becomes more restricted over time. And so they're not getting a normal, broad, varied diet. Um, they're getting a pretty restricted, usually carb-heavy diet. Um, children with autism have abnormal digestive enzyme function. So, you know, they're not breaking down the food that they're getting appropriately into the nutrients that can be utilized. They have inflamed gut mucosa, and that's going to lead to poor absorption. And they have metabolic abnormalities that, that even if they got the normal amount of nutrients, they're probably not using them um, as much as they should. So autistic children all meet those, those uh, risk factors. So there are studies done on, on nutrient status in autism, and many of those studies have found abnormalities. And in fact, if, if you look at the basic nutrients, these are, these are either studies that have been shown or at least suggested in the literature that uh, in autism that there's deficiencies in. And if you look at those deficiencies and put them in my little paradigm, um, you know, you can see clearly how, how a nutritional deficiency would impact these organ systems. Um, and so, you know, treating the deficiency is going to help your immune system work more effectively or help your brain work more effectively. Um, a lot of the reason for that are, are that those nutrients are cofactors for enzymes to work more appropriately. And if you don't have an, enough of those cofactors, your home biochemistry is not going to work right. And, you know, so take, for example, zinc. Zinc is a cofactor for over, over 80 different enzymes in your body. So if you're zinc deficient, um, you know, most of those enzymes are working in the immune system and in the neurological system. So if you're zinc deficient, you're not going to, um, those, those, that biochemistry is not going to work well. So what do I do? Um, I, number one, as far as the nutritional support, the most important thing is to, to work on a nutritionally appropriate diet. So you can become gluten-free, casein-free, and eat uh, French fries and Frito-Lays, corn chips. You know, that's technically gluten-free, casein-free, but it's certainly not nutritionally appropriate. And so no matter what they're eating, they, they need, you need to encourage a broader, healthier, um, more nutrient-dense um, 
diet. And, and luckily at, Th at Thoughtful House where I work, I, I have a nutritionist on staff, and several of them actually, and, and we emphasize that a lot as far as you know, having a nutritionist go over the diet with you and, and teaching, teaching you what the most appropriate um, nutrient-packed diet would be for your child. Now, it's a lot easier said than done, obviously. You know, kids are, they're, they are picky and it's hard to get food in. Um, but, you know, that's, that's something else that I think you can use your behavior therapist to help you is, you know, uh, implementing uh, diet in your ABA program, for example. You know, trying to get them to, to eat more foods. Um, so what are the rules for nutritional supplementation? Well, first of all, not all nutritional supplements are created equal. So I think you need to be careful about your sources and be sure that they're, that they're high quality, um, high grade supplements. Um, the, we use relatively high dosing for water-soluble vitamins, so that's mostly the B vitamins. And the reason for that is that, you know, because of their biochemical issues, sometimes you ha and their absorption issues, um, sometimes you have to push the doses higher than what typical recommended daily, or, or, you know, recommended daily allowance would be. Um, and with water-soluble vitamins, they, they don't accumulate in the body, so, so you can safely do that. You have to be careful with fat-soluble vitamins because they don't, they're not as excreted as easily and have the potential for toxicity. So you just need to be aware of that and not overdo it or at least be checking uh, blood levels to, to be sure that you're okay there. And then um, I tell all my patients to introduce, introduce things one at a time. I mean, with, with every medication or nutritional supplement that I've ever given, there's at least some kids that get worse instead of better on it. And, and usually it's hyperactivity or diarrhea or trouble sleeping or, you know, something, some other effect from that nutrient. And so, um, or, you know, often it, they may not tolerate that particular brand or, you know, if there's a flavoring in it or, or something else. And so I think it's important that as you introduce a new product that you don't throw five or six of them all at one time. Because if, if they get worse, then you don't know what it is. If they get better, immediately, then you also don't know what it is. And so, so it's, it's good, you know, I, I don't think you need to do months in between, but, but I think several, you know, days to week in, we, weeks in between adding something new in is, is useful. And I usually start low and kind of work up to a targeted dose for the same reason. So just be sure that they're tolerating it, that their body's getting used to this new onslaught of nutrients that they haven't been exposed to before. Um, and then I follow functional markers. Uh, so in other words, laboratories. Now, to be honest with you, a lot of the labs are not all that great as far as um, helping to understand exactly how much supplements to give as, as far as with nutrients in particular. And so you really kind of have to also look for, are they getting better? Are they improving? Are you seeing progress? Are they tolerating them? And, and that's definitely very individual for, um, for each kid. Okay, so this is what my basic nutritional supplement support is. And this is, this is again, what I, I try most kids with autism on just as a basic nutritional foundation. And it's a, it's a multivitamin that tends to have higher doses of, of B vitamins in particular. And, and there are many brands out on the market, there are many good companies, um, you know, and, and I don't, I don't uh, plug one company or another here, but, but you know, many of, the, many of the companies have good multivitamin, high, higher dose B vitamin products out there. Um, a multi-mineral, and, and for most kids I exclude copper because uh, copper metabolism is something that seems to be uh, also difficult for many kids with autism, and so giving extra copper would be detrimental. So it's best to avoid uh, adding additional copper into their, uh, into their diet as a supplement. Um, they usually need extra zinc, magnesium, and calcium. I, I give cod liver oil for a source of vitamin A, Vitamin D3, which is becoming increasingly uh, important, at least our understanding of it is, is increasing. Um, a quality fish oil for omega-3s, and, and be careful of the, of the product to be sure that it's is purified and, and especially mercury-free. And um, extra antioxidants like vitamin C and vitamin E. So, so that's what I try and get most of my kids with autism on. Um, so what about diet? What is the problem with food? Why do, why do we even talk about diet and autism? Well, there's a couple possibilities. This is, a, this is an antibody structure. And that's just to say that, that some people have an immunological reaction to certain foods. And so, you know, it may be triggering an antibody. And this could be IgE, which is more of an immediate hyperactivity, hypersensitivity reaction with 
hives and trouble breathing and, and you know, the classic anaphylaxis. That's less common. More common that we see is a sensitivity reaction, which is usually IgG mediated. And so that's a delayed reaction. It's not as easy to pick out and not as accurate probably as far as the testing goes. But, um, you know, there are these immune reactions that are triggered by food. And often what we see um, in these reactions are behavior changes. You know, flushed cheeks, flushed ears, um, chronic skin changes like eczema or, or you know, abnormal rashes. Uh, very commonly I see congestion. And so, you know, kids that especially are, that are milk sensitive seem to have chronic ear infections, chronic stuffy noses, trouble sleeping, and often taking milk out of their diet can make a big difference with that. Could be gastrointestinal, so it may be constipation or it could be loose stools that um, is food related. And so those are the type of symptoms that I'm looking for when I'm suspecting a food sensitivity. Um, the other possibility about food is that it may not be immunological at all. It could be the, the foods may have a direct impact on the brain. So with gluten and casein, for example, there's, there's, um, their breakdown products uh, form a structure that's very similar to opiate, which is like heroin or morphine. Uh, and so, you know, you, they, can have a, they can fit into a neurotransmitter or neurotransmitter receptor directly in the brain if it gets through, um, which can cause a direct effect. You know, there are many other foods that may have that type of thing. You know, so there's lots, lots of excitotoxins in foods, for example, like MSG or aspartame. Um, you know, there's something called phenol, which is a, a component of, of many fruits, red colored fruits, that also seems to have a direct effect on, on the brain pathway as a neurotransmitter. Kids can get very hyper and stimmy after eating, eating those foods sometimes. And so the, imp the important part about that is that you may not see a blood test that has an antibody to that food, but it still may be affecting them. And so I don't think that there's a test to tell you if your child needs to be on gluten-free, casein-free diet, for example. Um, I think that you, know, there's, you can do a test, and, and if it's positive and it has an antibody against it, then yeah, it's, it's worth, worth a trial. But because of the direct effect that it can have on the brain, I, I, I think the only real test is a trial of the diet. And so I think you just need to do an elimination challenge and see what happens and see if, you're, see, if you see neurological improvement or improvement in their, otherwise in their health. Um, and so what is the right diet for your child? Well, it really depends on your child. You know, it's not the same for everybody. Not every child responds to gluten-free, casein-free diet, for example. Some kids have more sensitivity to corn and, and rice and soy and, you know, apples and, and other things. And so, so I, I think that it really depends on, on your kid. And you have to realize that there's not a one-size-fits-all diet in autism. Um, how do you figure it out? Um, Elimination challenges, I think, ultimately is the best way. Now, if you want to do a food sensitivities test, I think it can give you a guide somewhere to start, maybe, um, looking at, you know, and, and kind of looking at the foods that are especially high and taking those out. But ultimately, you need to look at the clinical symptoms to see if you see improvement. Um, I usually start with gluten and casein. And the reason for that is, in, in my practice at least, when it, and a gluten casein free diet is done correctly, and I, I usually add soy-free in there as well because soy is, is very similar chemically to casein. Um, but when I, I would say 60 to 70 percent of, of the kids in my practice have had a response. Now, it may be mild or it may be significant, but usually it's enough that you keep going because, because it's making a difference. And so that's a pretty high percentage, and you know, that's, that's well worth a trial. If you're, if you're going to say anything in medicine that's a 60 to 70 percent response rate, it's well worth a trial of it. It's hard uh, initially, but it's not that bad once you get used to it. And, but again, I, I, and I think it's becoming easier over time because there's a lot more awareness about gluten sensitivity in the population. And so there's a lot more uh, available foods um, for, for you to choose from. But that's where I usually start, in, and I would um, typically give it at least three months on a, on a, G, a GFCF diet before I give up on it. Um, and the other common offenders, soy, eggs, corn, nuts, potatoes, and phenol foods. Those are, those are the most common. 
um, in, at least in my experience. But you know, that's when maybe a food sensitivity, sensitivities test may help guide you a little bit. You know, if you think that there's another food in there that you can't really figure out by clinically, you, getting a test may help you to narrow that down a little bit. Um, but yeah, you have to keep in mind that it's not just gluten and casein, and you have to figure out the right thing for your child. Now, there are many other diets that are used and, and um, talked about in autism. And each of these diets, I think, are more dependent on the kid. You know, a specific carbohydrate diet, there's something called a low oxalate diet, a body ecology diet, fine gold diet. You know, new diets come out all the time, it seems like. Um, and again, you know, there may be different reasons for each of these diets, and I really don't have time to go into any of them in detail. But um, just keep in mind that the most important thing is that um, you're starting with a healthy diet. And so, you know, what you don't want to do is make your child nutritionally deficient because of the diet that you're giving them. And, and there are ways to do each of these diets and have them completely nutritional, nutritionally appropriate. Um, but that may take help, help with the nutritionist for, for you to be able to learn that. Um, don't diet hop and diet shop, meaning, you know, don't try gluten-free, casein-free for a month and then do SED for a month and then try low oxalate for a month. And, um, it won't give you enough time to, to know what's helping. And so you, you really, especially with diet changes, you need to give it some time. Give it some time both for the child to improve but also for you to get good enough of the diet to know that you're doing it right. Um, okay, coordinate all diet plans with your medical care provider. So, you know, if, you're, if you are trying a new intervention, your doctor prescribes something to you like methyl B12 shots or something like that, and then you decide to make a diet change, uh, you may not, and he gets worse, you, you may not know what it is. And so, again, I think it's important that, that when you make changes in your diet to coordinate that with your, diet, with your medical practitioner. And also, if there's a, a diet infraction, so for example, if you're gluten-free, casein-free, and he gets a big uh, amount of gluten, and then he starts going downhill, um, you need to make your doctor aware of that also so that, that he knows how to, um, how to work that into the other things that he's thinking about. Okay, um, so moving on, the gut. So what do GI symptoms in autism look like? I want to just give a little case report. This is a, this is a boy, um, he's about 10 years old, that we saw, it's been a couple of years now. Um, he has a history of regressive autism, but was, is quite severe, um, is nonverbal. Um, but over, the mom has reported that overall, he's actually generally a pretty happy kid, or at least he was. And, um, you know, didn't have a whole lot of behavior problems. Um, but over the course of the couple of years prior, preceding when we had seen him, he was having escalating behaviors. And, and at the time that we saw them, they had become very severe. And um, the behaviors, I don't know how well you can see it back there, but if, if you look up on his, on his chest, he's got a bunch of bruises on his chest. These marks on his face are scratches, self-injurious scratches, where he's just basically tearing at his face. Um, and he has, um, you know, if, if you look up and down his arms, or you can see the bruises all up and down his arms. This is his mom, who's not very much bigger than him, actually, but, but she had to, um, he got to so bad that if somebody wasn't holding his arms physically, then he would be hurting himself. And so it was exhausting for, for both her and their family. Um, and... This is his back, all the bruises, pinch marks, where, where he would just hit his, hit his back and pinch himself, um, and bite marks, scars on his hands. And so this was a, a severely self-injurious kid. Okay. Can, um, now, he had been to their doctors. You know, their primary care doctor had referred him to a neurologist. Um, the neurologist had tried all of the um, psychiatric medications that that they knew, um, none of which helped, um, some of which made him worse. Um, they had seen a gastroenterologist previously because of constipation, which he'd had for a long time. Um, and the treatment f that they prescribed was Miralax. You know, they didn't really do any kind of a workup or, or do anything else like that. Um, in fact, the, uh, uh, you know, this is a, a kid who also had pica, which is, you know, basically eating non-edible items, and, and to the point that he actually chewed through the slats of his wooden crib, and they had to replace it with stainless steel. 
Um, but he would eat the batting out of his diaper a lot also, you know, just especially when he was upset, he would just start eating his diaper. And, you know, the gastroenterologist basically said, give Miralax and give more fiber. And, and, the, and when the mom said, but doctor, why is he eating all the, all the di why is he eating his diapers and, and the cotton out of his diapers? And, and the gastroenterologist said, well, he's autistic. At least it's a decent source of fiber. And so that was the workup the GI workup given to the kid. And so when we heard about him, you know, at the time that we heard about him, you know, they had basically given up on most of the psych meds and had just tried to sedate him. You know, so he was, he was basically on, on relatively high doses of Ativan, uh, lorazepam, to just kind of keep him sedate because if he wasn't sedated, he would just be hurting himself. And, and even then, it didn't work that great. And so when, when they contacted us, you know, we had a suspicion that there was something else going on besides just autism. And, uh, you know, brought him down to Thoughtful House and, and ended up getting him scoped. Now, the interesting part about that story is that on the way, they lived, out, they lived in a different state from Texas. On the way down, he grabbed his bottle of Ativan and, and downed it. You know, so he, I don't know how many was in there, but um, he, he took a lot of Ativan. And, and so they had to stop at an ER. Um, and you can imagine how scary that would be as a mother. She thought for sure that she was not going to be leaving with her child. Because if you go into an emergency room with a child that looks like this, having been a former, former ER doctor, your biggest suspicion is, is child abuse. Um, especially you're in a different state. He overdosed on Ativan. It looks like this. It's not looking good. But, you know, so, but, you know, obviously she, she needed, she knew that she needed to stop and he did fine. Um, luckily, I guess, the, the ER doctor soon realized who was causing the injury because, you know, as soon as he was um, awake, he was hurting himself. And so, you know, it, it was pretty clear what was going on. And so, so they let him, they let him go. He made it down to Thoughtful House. We did a scope on him and he had, he had quite severe esophagitis, gastritis, and duodenitis. So the first part of the small bowel. Um, so he was treated with appropriate GI meds, you know, um, including anti-inflammatory medications and um, antacids. And within a couple of weeks, he was doing fa fantastic. And this is the letter from the parents um, that I'll just briefly read. Within three to four days of treatment, he completely stopped clawing his face. As you are well, as, as you are well aware, he would little, literally rip the skin on his cheeks, forehead, nose, and chin compulsively, and there was no stopping him. It took two adults at all times to try to keep him from either getting to his face or beating his chest or pinching his arms, hips, and back. He would also walk right up to you, stare you right in the eyes, and then start slapping himself in the face as hard as he possibly could. That behavior is gone, as are all the bruises and scratches, but the scars aren't. He had a wonderful Christmas, thanks to you all, and more than that, he is still here. I believe that he would have figured out some great way to get himself out of pain had you all not helped him when you did. He is happy again, doing great in school, and who knows what is around the corner for him. So keep in mind, this was a progression over several years. And within a few days of finding the appropriate treatment, symptoms went away. Um, and this is him at, this is three weeks later. And so you can see he still has a few of the scars, but no fresh wounds on his face. He seems happy, he's content. Um, the, wound, the bruises on his chest are, are gone. Bruises on the back are mostly gone. Um, and he had a great Christmas. The important point of this story is don't blame everything on behavior and realize that you know, there's more going on and especially if, if your child is nonverbal or minimally verbal, you have, to, you have to be a sleuth and try and figure out what it is and, and, and look beyond the brain sometimes. So gut disease and autism does not always seem like gut disease or can be easily explained away as other things, but um, unexplained crying, tantrums, nighttime wakening, maybe from reflux and general irritability, voc vocalizing complaints. I, I do have, have had the history of a lot of parents that have said, well, you know, he says owie, owie, or, you know, tummy hurt or something like that, but then he seems okay, so we didn't really believe him, you know. So, so again, if they're vocalizing it, he probably, they probably have it. Um, posturing, we'll talk about what that is in a minute. Um, irritability just prior to a bowel movement, hyperactivity or distractibility prior to bowel movements, and self-injurious behavior. This is abdominal posturing, um, where the kids are putting pressure on their lower abdomen. And a lot, of, a lot of kids with autism spend a lot of time doing this, where you know, they, they 
constantly feel like they need to have pressure down low. This little boy on the left who's on the exercise ball, that's how he slept. Um, and he put his little stuffed dog under his head as a pillow. You can, you can kind of see that, but that, that was his most comfortable sleeping position. Um, and then, you know, this, the little boy on the right, that's a pretty common thing, you know, where they're putting pressure on their lower, their lower abdomen, and that may be relieving abdominal discomfort. What does a typical autism poop look like? It's usually this, kind of that chronic, mushy, loose stool. Anybody's kids have this? So, you know, this is a common problem. Um, and often, you know, this is, this is kind of blown off as toddler's diarrhea. Well, if your kid's five or six, he's not a toddler anymore. If he's still having this, this stool, it's not toddler's diarrhea. And in fact, I'm not even sure that I believe that there is such a thing. But, um, you know, toddler's diarrhea should not be chronic and loose and persistent. And so, so if you, you know, I, I, we have lots of kids that come to us that have never had a formed stool. Um, that's not normal. And if you, so if your stool looks like this, it's not classic bloody diarrhea, which most gastroenterologists look for to rule out inflammatory bowel disease. But it's this chronic, loose, unformed stool, which shows that there's something going on in their bowel. Um, or it can be constipation, you know, where it's either very large volume stools or, um, you know, often stringy stools, but bulky, it fills the toilet. Um, or constipation also can be loose stool, but it takes, but it's hard for them to get it out. You know, so several days between bowel movements, but it comes out loose. Now, if that happens, again, you, you know that there's something wrong with the colon because if, if you have stool that's sitting in the colon, it's supposed to absorb all the water out of it. And so it should come out hard if, if it's sitting in the bowel for that long. And if it's coming out loose, it's either because things are leaking around and impaction or that the colon's not absorbing uh, water from it. All right, enough poop pictures. All right, abdominal distension. So again, this is, this is also very common. Um, sometimes it's a little bit harder to tell in, in toddlers who often have a little bit of a poochy belly anyway, but if it's extreme or they don't flatten out as they get older, then, then that's, that's an issue. O often you see a flatter belly in the morning and by the end of the day it's big and distended like this. Mus poor growth or muscle atrophy. So the kid, uh, both of these kids um, basically, I mean, just look at their big distended bellies but you can see their ribs, skinny limbs. So this is not much unlike the picture of mal malnutrition that you see in third world countries. Um, so poor growth, poor atrophy, dropping off the, bro dropping off the growth curve. Um, those are all symptoms suggesting GI problems. So what do I do to try and figure out what the cause of it is? Well, there's several questions in my head that I ask. And one is, is it a food sensitivity? Is it malabsorption or maldigestion? Is it something going on in the gut as far as pathogenic gut bugs? Um, is it a motility problem, which is maybe more of a neurotransmitter issue? Or is it inflammatory bowel disease? So let's talk about leaky gut syndrome. Now, I'm, I, if you think about it, the inside of our bowels is still outside of our body because our bowel is just like a big hollow tube. And it's not until it crosses that mucosa, that lining that it enters our body. And so one of the jobs of the bowel is to let things in that it wants to get in and keep things out that it doesn't want to get in. So it's, it's really a barrier. It's a barrier fence. And, and so just like with a, with a border patrol, you want things to channel through gates and not just to be leaking through the fence. And so um, what happens in the gut is that sometimes um, things leak through when they shouldn't, where they shouldn't. And let me see if I can see. So this, this would be the, the inside of the gut, so the inside of the tube. This is the, the lining cells, and this would be inside the body. And so these just represent food particles um, that are being broken down. Ultimately, you want these bigger particles to be broken down into smaller particles. And then these smaller particles should be uh, attached to the cell surface and then absorb like this one, absorb down through the middle of the cell where the cell can control it. Um, in between the cells should be tight junctions. So these are not gates. These should not be allowed to leak through. But if these junctions are leaky, then these bigger particles can leak through like this. Now when that happens, that, your body has less control about what's coming in. 
you know, things may not be digested fully and they're, they're leaking in, or, or toxins that would normally be excluded would be leaking in. So it can cause a problem. Um, so what do we do to fix it? Well, first of all, we clear the border zone. So, so in other words, you want to get rid of all, as much of the things that you don't want to get in the body as possible. And part of that is diet changes. You know, so if they're gluten and casein sensitive and those peptides are leaking through, taking them out of their diet is, is a good way to prevent that from happening. Digestive enzymes can help to break down those particles more effectively so that you know, you're not getting the big ones that are breaking through or that are um, sliding through as easily. Antibiotics and antifungals, because some of the other things that, that can be leaking through are toxins from, or metabolites from yeast and abnormal bacteria. And so trying to treat those things also can help um, uh, prevent problems. And then patching the fence, there's ways that you can try and heal the gut. Antioxidants, glutathione, sulfate. Sulfate is actually the, the, the molecule that forms that bond in between the cells. And if you're sulfate deficient, which many kids with autism are, you're not forming that bond very well. Fatty acids can also help heal that lining. Um, and then you beef up border security. So, so giving things like probiotics and natural antifungals to prevent um, abnormal bacteria needs to grow, to grow back in is also useful. Okay, so what about our gut flora? What about our gut bugs? Why do we care? Well, it turns out that there are more cells in our body that are bacterial derived than there are human cells. So there are trillions of bacteria in our gut and it plays a major role in our body and we're just, we're now only starting as in medicine, only scratching the surface of understanding what that, what that does for us. We know that good bacteria help to digest food. We know that they help to produce nutrients and vitamins. They help to prevent other bacteria from growing in. Um, and we're also becoming aware that the general population bacterial flora is, is deteriorating and most likely from chronic antibiotic use over the last several, many decades. And so, um, you know, that's part of the general population issue. Um, in autism, it seems, it seems to even be more prevalent. And, you know, there have been several studies now that have looked at it and have, have documented abnormal levels of, of uh, bacteria, especially, is what they've seen in the studies, um, and benefit from treatment of those, uh, those organisms. Um, the reason why I think it helps is that many of those bacteria and yeast can produce metabolites. So part of their waste product are chemicals that can then affect the brain. And so there's a, a bacteria in particular called Clostridium, which is the same family of bacteria that cause tetanus and botulism, both of which are severe neurological impairments. Um, but many of the other clostridial species have neuro neurotoxic transmitters also. And, and so Dr. McFabe, who I think has been at this conference, I believe, talks, talks about this clostridium um, acid, propionic acid that's produced, and, and has shown how that, uh, that acid can affect behavior in rats. And, you know, from my clinical experience, uh, clostridium and yeast have predictable neurological behavior responses as well. And, and often you see kids that are more stimmy, more hyper, trouble sleeping, giggling, laughing incessantly, all that kind of stuff, are kids that seem to be, for lack of a better word, yeasty, that often respond when you treat them either with metronidazole, which is an antibiotic, or um, an antifungal. Carnitine is another supplement that can be used to help break down fatty acids, so you're trying to break down that, that uh, metabolic product. Um, probiotics to help discourage growth of those abnormal bacteria. And if you have family members with, with, symptoms, with similar symptoms, even if they're not autistic, you should consider at least testing them because you know, these, these organisms can be spread back and forth between the family. Um, avoid unnecessary oral antibiotics, especially at an early age. You know, so don't treat your kids with every virus that they, that they have with antibiotics because that's just more likely to wipe out their, um, their flora. And especially when they're younger, when they're, that's, that first year, year of life is the most important time to establish what your normal gut flora is. Okay, I need to move faster. What about motility problems? I think that this, unfortunately, is what's happening in our kids' bowels. I don't know really which way that they're supposed to go. 
Um, so, so often I think that you know they're constipated or they're they're having loose stools or you know they have they're constipated with loose stools and, and and I think a lot of it is that they just their neurotransmitter function just like it is in the brain is abnormal and it's not it's not being regulated well so you're not having that normal flow um, and it's that's not easy to correct but certainly treating constipation is important because it's very uncomfortable and you know so. Uh, if, if your kids are constipated or suspect that they're constipated, often you, you can suspect that by sudden worsening in behaviors. Um, then I would do a clean out uh, to just get them pooping. And you know, normally I, I favor more natural ways of doing that like magnesium and vitamin C and fiber, um, but medications or enemas if needed. All right, so is it inflammatory bowel disease? Now, now, you know, many kids with autism have been diagnosed with this condition. And usually, uh, you know, the only way to completely rule it out is to do it, is a scope and a biopsy. Um, but a, a fairly high percentage of the kids that have been scoped have varying degrees of, inf of inflammation there. And it can be anywhere from as severe as, as Crohn's disease to, to relatively mild, but still present. Um, these, these are just some examples uh, of, we, we actually see inflammation anywhere from the mouth to the anus. So it, it works a lot more like Crohn's disease where it can be patchy and scattered throughout the bowel. But it's very common to see esophagitis, so inflammation of the esophagus. Um, usually not reflux, but more allergy mediated inflammation. It's called eosinophilic esophagitis. You can see inflammation in the stomach and the duodenum. Um, by pill cams, which are little pills that you swallow, we're, we're seeing a lot of pathology in the small bowel. And then um, this is a terminal ileum. This is lymph node hyperplasia. So lymph nodes are kind of like tonsils in, in our body that help um, with the immune response. And in many kids with autism, they're excessively enlarged. And then when you look under biopsy, all these little purple dots here are inflammatory cells. And so none of those are normal at least at that degree to be there. And so this is, this is very consistent with inflammatory bowel disease. Now, we have a gastroenterologist that works with us at Thoughtful House, and how does he treat this? Same way that he would treat Crohn's disease. And so he puts them on anti-inflammatories, in, in many cases steroids temporarily to help decrease the inflammation, antacids, and, and treats it that way. Um, and many of the kids have responded very well. Okay, so again, the important thing is that you have to maintain a high degree of suspicion um, because they may not tell you that they're having a lot of abdominal pain and, and it's usually, they usually don't have bloody diarrhea. And so, but if they have chronic abnormal loose stools and other symptoms suggestive of inflammatory bowel disease, then, then I would have it further investigated. I usually do that if, if they're not responding to the initial treatments, diet changes and probiotics and treating gut bugs and, and the other things that I try. So it's not, it's not the first thing that I jump to. Okay, we talked about that. All right, so the next step is, is uh, detoxification. Um, so the question is, do children with autism have an impaired ability to detoxify themselves? And are they particularly sensitive to environmental exposures? Well, we know that kids with autism have, have oxidative stress. This is well established in the medical literature. What is that? Basically, oxidative stress is part of the body's normal metabolism. Um, and so when your mitochondria, which are your energy producing cells, um, start to break down the products to produce energy, there's byproducts that are produced. And those are called reactive oxide sp oxygen species. Those, that secondary byproduct can cause damage. Cause damage inside the cell, it can cause damage to the DNA, it can cause damage to the cell membranes. Your body has protective mechanism against that, and they're basically antioxidants. And um, what we're finding is that kids with autism seem to have higher levels of reactive oxygen species and not enough antioxidant potential. And so that leaves them with more cellular damage. Um, how do we prevent it? We give more antioxidants. And um, things like, uh, you know, so these are the body's mechanisms of doing it. These are all the enzymes. But there are, there are other things that you can give that would help to boost this, this uh, function. So glutathione is your, one of your body's main detoxifying antioxidants. Vitamin C, vitamin E, vitamin K. Um, these are all, all antioxidants, many of which you can, you can actually give as supplements. Um, when things go wrong, I think I mentioned this before, so I'm going I'm to um, skip through it. 
So many studies now have documented oxidative stress in autism. It's, it's very well established. Um, oxidative stress is also a component of many other chronic neurological disorders like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's. Um, and so I think that there may be a common mechanism about what's happening in the brain. Um, what is methylation? Methylation is also an important cycle that we're finding in, oxygen, or in autism. And Dr. Jill James has done a lot of work on this. And basically what the methylation cycle does is it helps to control um, your body's proteins. And so it turns things on and turns things off. And so it, um, as it goes through this cycle, hooking with the folic acid cycle and going around the methylation cycle, that little methyl group gets donated to um, or gets attached to proteins or DNA or neurotransmitters and can turn them off. And so it's one way that our body controls what genes are being expressed. And so, you know, it turns off viral genes that aren't supposed to be there. Um, and it, it is the other way that it regulates our, our body's brain chemistry. And so if you have abnormalities in this pathway, those things may be um, impaired. The other thing methylation cycle does is it, it feeds into the detoxification cycle. So if you're not methylating well, you're also not detoxifying well. Um, what have we found in autism? Well, first of all, if you have oxidative stress, it's going to shut down that pathway. And, and it feeds it more towards that detoxification system, but at the expense of methylating neurotransmitters and other things. Um, and also in autism, we've, we've, there's research has shown that there's blocks in many areas in this, in this pathway. And so it seems to be a central issue in these kids. And interestingly, a lot of the supplements that we use also fit into this pathway. So things like methyl B12 and TMG and B6 and zinc um, and taurine and magnesium sulfate, these all have roles to play in this pathway, which may be why it's helping. Um, is there evidence that autism is associated with environmental exposures? Well, there's many studies that are, are looking at this. Unfortunately, not enough. As you know, um, autism rates are ex increasing exponentially. And, you know, I think it's pretty well established now that it's not just because we're diagnosing it better. You know, it's, it's up to one in 100 in the states. And um, as 20 years ago, it was one in 5,000. So um, the, the rates are increasing, which means that it's environmental. There's no such thing as a genetic epidemic. It's somehow how the environment is, is um, interacting probably with, with the genetics that's, that's causing the problem. Um, most of the studies that have been done in autism have been looking at autism genes. Um, I believe that that needs to be shifted to where most of the studies are looking at the environment based on what we're seeing. But the studies that have been done have shown links. So th they've looked at um, mercury metabolism, other heavy metal metabolism. They've looked at, um, you know, so this is just a study that looked at air emission to merc mercury, so mercury in the air, and found a tight correlation with the number of kids with autism in that area. Um, you know, when they, and they tried to control for all the other variables. Um, there was another study out of uh, San Francisco that showed a similar thing, 50% um, higher risk in the upper quartile of exposure. Um, and the highest links were with mercury, cadmium, nickel, uh, trichloroethylene, and vinyl chloride. Another study done in California showed that if you lived close to a, a farm that sprayed organopesticides, your risk of autism was six times. So again, many clues are piecing together that says, you know, there is an environmental problem and these kids are at higher risk. So what do I do about that? Well, you know, part of it is you try and support, you know, it's very difficult to clean up the environment, obviously. You try and clean up the local environment as best you can. Um, but a lot of it is trying to support their own detoxification pathways. So increasing antioxidants, methylation support, including folinic acid and methyl B12, sulfation, Epsom salts baths are a good way to do that, um, and taurine can help. Direct glutathione support, so there's various ways that you can give glutathione directly. And for those people who t that test with elevated he metal, heavy metals, they consider chelation. Okay, um, I'm going to skip briefly through the immune system and then I'm probably going to have to stop. But. Do children with autism have immune system problems? Well, this is also well established in the, in the medical literature. There's immune dysregulation. It's like, it's like this traffic jam. You know, the, they don't know if they're coming or going. You know, some kids have chronic excessive inflammation. Some kids, um, you know, have low levels of, of some cells and not others. And, and, but there's not a defined 
autism immune pattern. It's just abnormality is the pattern. Um, there's inflammation. So there's chronic inflammation that's been documented, well documented in the gut. There's been inflammation documented in the brain. Um, and, you know, this seems to be a chronic issue. There's autoantibodies. So antibodies attacking their own body. And these are all, all the studies that have been done on that, you know, that have documented that. Um, autistic children respond abnormally to infections. Um, many viral illnesses are known to cause autism, um, historically anyway. And uh, children with autism have been shown to have a higher frequency of infections, especially the first year of life, with ear infections, sinus infections, and chronic antibiotic use. Um, that typically does get a lot worse in their, in their second year after they start eating. Um, and again, I think this is likely a result of inadequate or inappropriate immune response. What do I do to treat the immune system? Well, first of all, you give immune supporting nutrients. So you, you want to be sure that they have enough zinc and vitamin A and, and omega-3 fatty acids. You remove allergens. So if there's things in, in their diet or their environment that they're clearly reacting to, you need to get those out. You've got to stop triggering that immune system. Um, treat allergies, which I usually do with, with you know, typical medications, antihistamines, um, uh, things like Singular, which is a uh, leukotriene in inhibitor, um, and sometimes allergen desensitization therapies have been useful. Um, there's a lot of off-label medications that are being studied and used um, for autism, including uh, medications like Actos, which is a diabetes medicine, um, spironolactone, which is a, di it's a blood pressure medicine, a diuretic. Um, these all, but these all have activity against that immune pathway and, and this chronic uh, immunological trigger. And so often you see improvement in, in the right kids to um, help that get better. Um, antivirals, IVIG, uh, hyperbaric oxygen, you know, treating PANDAS, which is an autoimmune reaction triggered by strep. These are all part of the um, immune things that I look at. Okay, and finally, treating the brain. I'm going to have to skip through this, but let me just, let me just say that the, the bottom line is that not every kid with autism has the same brain issue. So, you know, there's lots of studies that have been done on the brain, you know, looking at anatomy, looking at biochemistry, looking at, at physiology, and there's lots of different patterns. So there's not a defined autism brain. Um, there's abnormalities in the cerebellum. There's abnormalities in the frontal lobe. Um, most of the time, grossly, they appear normal. Sometimes they're a little bit enlarged. Um, but again, every study is a little bit different because, because each kid is a little bit different. Um, and I think that that's why they all respond differently to different treatments. But um, one thing that, that is becoming more and more clear is that there's an inflammatory process going on there. So trying to target and treat that inflammation uh, would make sense to help. Um, there's abnormal neuro neurochemistry, and so a lot of the supplements that, and medications are trying to target those neurotransmitters and get them back into more normal balance. I'm sorry, I'm having to go through this quickly. Um, there's abnormalities between excitotoxicity versus, uh, so the excito, excitatory neurotransmitters versus inhibitory neurotransmitters. So glutamate, for example, is an excitatory transmitter. They seem to be too much of that and not enough GABA, which is supposed to balance that out. Um, and that also fits with their behaviors. There's autonomic nervous system dysfunction. So this is the autonomic nervous system is what controls everything that you don't have to think about. So um, on the sympathetic nervous system side, that's your fight or flight response. The parasympathetic is, is the kind of relax, lower your blood pressure, allow bodily functions to happen. You just don't want both of these happening at the same time. And so, you know, if you're being chased by a tire, you don't want to have to stop to poop. And so your body has this regulation mechanism that if you're in fight or flight, it shuts down the other pathway. And unfortunately, I think most of our kids with autism are kind of in the fight or flight pathway most of the time. And, and they're not balancing that or regulating it very well. Seizures are common, um, and many of these are subclinical and are being picked up by, by longer EEGs and showing some response with, with treatment. Sleep abnormality is also common. Kids up in the middle of the night, jumping up and down, can't go to sleep, have trouble falling to sleep. And these are things that often are, are very amenable to treatment, but you also have to consider things like uh, abnormal gut bugs uh, and diet and uh, inflammation in the bowel that may be waking them up. 
And then, so my overview about treating the brain is first I remove false neurotransmitters, so things that are in there that aren't supposed to be there. So for example, things from gut organisms, diet, et cetera. I use neuromodulatory supplements first. So whether that be melatonin or GABA or 5-HTP, um, oxytocin. Um, and in, in some kids, uh, we, we do use it medications, you know, so I don't want to say that there's no role for that. I think that there is a role in many kids. Um, but it, uh, the point is that it should be kind of the top of the treatment rather than the first thing. And um, because most of the medications do have side effects. And, you know, you have to, it's a matter of finding the right medicine for the right child. Um, education behavior management is, is critical. I mentioned this at first as well. But, um, you know, and there's lots of different methods, and I'm not an expert in that. Um, I do tend to favor ABA based on my personal experience with it. Um, but I think the bottom line is that the kids need specialized and individualized intervention and lots of it. And, and the more that they get, the better they do. Okay, in, finally, never give up. You know, as parents of autistic kids, I, I think it, it's, it's a challenge. I know it. I live it. Um, it, it can be frustrating if, if your child is not one of the quick responders that you, you hear about. Um, the reality is, is that for most kids, it's a, it's a marathon. It's a, lots of ups and downs along the way, but you should see them improving with, with intervention. And if things are starting to go downhill, you need to revisit that. But we're, we're understanding more. We're getting better at it. We're, the science is coming out. Um, and, you know, I, never, I would never say that there's an age where your child cannot improve, whether he's 2 or 32. And, and I've, I've seen people all along, the spectrum, all along that age spectrum with significant improvements in, in, improvements in, in their overall life and um, in their neurological function. Now, what we've learned is that kids with autism can recover, means, meaning that their diagnosis can be dropped. They can become indistinguishable from, indistinguishable from their peers. Success for me is not measured by recovery, necessarily. It's measured by improvement in the quality of life and, and allowing them to, to lead a functional and happy life, whether they're fully recovered or not. So I, I think that as parents, remember that, you know, don't, don't make this goal of recovery your only thing because, you know, still it's, it's the minority of kids that get there. And so the important part also is to enjoy that journey and to celebrate every little progress that happens because if you don't do that, then you're missing out a lot. And, and these kids, you know, give us a, a special opportunity to kind of not take things for granted. And so um, just remember that as you're going through, and, and especially on those frustrating days. But thanks for having me.